respects of the Most Honorable Sir Howard Felix Hanlon Cook, November 13, 1915 through July 11, 2014. As you join us here, we are seeing the arrivals of a, a number of persons who have already entered the church, the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Anthony Anderson, Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Andrew Holness, Senator A.J. Nicholson, House Speaker Michael Paird, Protocol expert Merrick Needham, Mike Henry, opposition MP, have already all entered the church. And you can see on the outside arrivals still taking place. If you're just joining us, the coffin has been lying in state for almost an hour. It's a sunny day, there's a bit of haze, but uh, no threats of weather or bad weather at this time. You can hear the members of the National Chorale in their musical tribute. And we are seeing the cathedral that's been recently restored to a great extent with the help of the former ambassador to Spain, Her Excellency Celsa Nino. And uh, she spent a lot of time in ensuring that the cathedral, or to a great extent, was restored to its uh, original glory. It was completed in 1911. And uh, Professor Barrico was brought in from Spain for the restoration job. You can have a look as you're seeing now all the detailed and intricate work that was carried out. There is a dome on the outside of the cathedral you'd have seen. There's a pipe organ being played at this time by Mr. Dwight Mack Bean. There's a dome, which is the, the, an, an impressive 85-foot dome, copper-covered dome on the outside. You can see former Governor General here now, Sir Kenneth Hall and Lady Hall. Bruce Golding is also in attendance to say his farewell, former leader of the opposition. Lady Hall, Sir Kenneth Hall, former Governor General. And visiting from the Cayman Islands in that shot, William McKeever Bush, leader of the opposition. That's a shot you just missed. Now we have other dignitaries entering the cathedral at this time. Here we have the Minister of Finance. That is uh, William McKeever Bush from the Cayman in the left of this. Mrs. Phillips and Dr. Peter Phillips, Dr. Quentin Ferguson, Minister Hilton, members of the cabinet, members of People's National Party, of which Sir Howard Cook was a member now, the Chief of Defense Staff. Major General Anthony Anderson. There we have Mrs. Morris, the President of the Senate, Mr. Floyd Morris. Mr. Andrew Holness is in conversation, it seems, with Mr. Morris at this time. The service will officially start in 10 minutes from now, and perhaps I should guide you as to who the officiating clergy are. The Right Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble Bloomfield, the moderator of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, and you would have known that uh, Howard is a member of the United Church and indeed formed the Farm Heights United Church in St. James. Reverend Norbert Stevens, the General Secretary of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. Reverend Dr. Margaret Fowler, the Minister of the Hope United Church. Reverend Dr. Gordon Evans, the Minister of St. Paul's United Church. Reverend Dr. Howard Gregory, Bishop of the Diocese of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. The Most Reverend Charles Gilford, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Kingston. The Most Reverend Edgerton Clark, Archbishop. 
Archbishop Emeritus of Kingston, the Most Reverend and Honorable Donald Dr. J. Rees, Archbishop Emeritus of Kingston, Reverend Dr. Maitland Evans, President of the International University of the Caribbean, who will also be bringing the message, Reverend Everald Galbraith, President of the Jamaican Council of Churches, and Reverend Dr. Paul Gardner, President of the Moravian Church in Jamaica. Those are the members of the officiating clergy. Our organist today, Mr. Dwight McBean, and groups performing and who have performed the National Choir of Jamaica now will perform at this time. Here we have former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Edward Siaga and Mrs. Siaga making their way to their places here at the Holy Trinity Cathedral.
also to the music of the National Chorale, you see former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, greeting members of the congregation. And he was, in fact, chosen by Sir Howard to give the remembrance, as were, I gather, most of the persons who will take part in this program today. They were selected, or definitely he gave his guidance as to who he would like to participate in his service. So former Prime Minister P.J. Pass now making his way to the front from where he will be given. Now the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Most Honorable Portia Simpson Miller, along with the Most Honorable Harold Miller, arrive here at the Holy Trinity Cathedral for the start of the funeral service. And the last arrival, we should say, should be the Governor General at this time. And it'll be a prompt start at 10. The Governor General will be interred at the Peebles Circle. The first Governor General to be interred there, former Governors General, were interred elsewhere. For example, Sir Florence Glasgow was interred at the Providence Methodist Church in Ligony. And now a section of Heroes Park has been designated for Governors General. The first one, of course, will be Sir Howard Cook. His gravesite has been um, located just across from the monument of Michael Manley, former Prime Minister. And now we see the Governor General and Monsignor arriving at this time. Governor General with his ADC. Sir Patrick Allen now makes his way to the front of the church for the official start of the Thanksgiving service for Sir Howard Felix Handon Cook, former Governor General of Jamaica, former educator, former patriot. The Bible will be brought into the church by Mrs. Lynn Williams, a lay pastor. The opening sentences will be delivered by Reverend Dr. Margaret Fowler, Reverend Dr. Paul Gardner, and Reverend Dr. Gordon Evans. And the first hymn will be, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, the Gathering Hymn. You can see the, it's a little warm in the cathedral as it usually is. So you can see the insignias on the insignia cushions resting on top of the flag draped coffin here in the Holy Trinity Cathedral as we prepare for the official start of this Thanksgiving service. So Howard Cook touched the lives of many persons. About 50 members of his family traveled in from Antigua Bay to say farewell today. His three children, Justice Howard Cook, Audrey Faith Cook, and Richard MacDonald Cook. He has three surviving brothers and one sister. Two of the three brothers will be in attendance at this service. It's curious to note that Sir Howard was in fact married to Ivy Sylvia Lucille Ty on July 22, 1939. Had he lived until that date, he would have, they would have been married for 75 years. So he died 11 days shy of their 75th wedding anniversary. Lady Cook is just a year younger than Sir Howard, and she really had this wonderful way about her of um, touching some of us to remind us, do you know how old Sir Howard is? And she was very proud of how well he had done, and, and as the years went by, how alert he was. They had a really wonderful marriage, 75 years. Now the family makes their way in. You can see the protocol officer, Sophia Moulton, preparing to see the family members, Heather uh, and Justice Howard Cook. There we also have uh, Richard MacDonald Cook, 
Order Faith Cook. These are the immediate members of the family. It must indeed be a moment of which they have mixed emotions as they have been hearing all the wonderful things being said about their father. And now if you we look in the center aisle, we'll see Lady Cook as she makes her entrance. There she is. Lady Cook being brought here this morning and being attended by Seeing, so I'm not able to give you the direct comment. Ah, here she is, Lady Cook, coming to say farewell. Ha, a nice handshake, one of reassurance and comfort from the JDF officer. You can feel that. She's looking really very lovely in her off-white. and being attended by members of the Jamaica Defense Force. She's a year younger than Sir Howard, so that would place her at 97. So the matriarch of the family is here, and Sir Howard was the patriarch of the family. I spoke with one of his relatives, Kathy Cook, and when I said to her, what is it that you would want to be known most about uh, your uncle? And she said that he was a head of the Cook family. Not that he was a governor general, or that he was a member of parliament, or that he was called sir, that he was a head of the Cook family. And he was born at Goodwill over in St. James. And this was a man with goodwill. He shared it with everyone every step of the way. So Lady Cook now is being assisted into her seat by members of the JDF. We allow the time. Oh, and her eldest son gives her a nice kiss on the lips, and there is a nice warm smile from her. And now, Justice Howard Cook could be considered the head of the Cook family at this time, although they are in fact older ones. And here uh, is some information. It was none other than Ivy Sylvia Lucille Tai who caught the eye of young Cooksey. She was an honors graduate of the Bethlehem Training College and had been especially selected to teach at the Kingston Senior School. And um, listen to this account of their first meeting from the book They Call Me Teacher, authored by Jackie Ranston. Good afternoon, Miss Tai. I've come to tell you that I'm going to marry you just like that. She simply smiled, didn't say a word. And then he says, I was struck by her. What had caused me to make such an outburst? I don't know then. I still don't know. We talked a little, but since she only answered yes or no, the conversation didn't get very far. But Cooksey was persistent and eventually won his case. On July 22, 1939, Howard Cook and Ivy Ty became husband and wife in the cathedral, the very first couple to be married in the cathedral, in the chapel rather, at the Michael. the Governor General paying his respects to Lady Cook and all the members of the family at this time. Justice Howard Cook rises as the Governor General speaks with him. This is the eldest son of the Cooks. And the other members of the family are greeted by the present Governor General, His Excellency, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen. time to offer words of comfort to these grieving members. 
But I remember Sir Howard, for some reason, uh, he was one of my special people, and his wife was exceptionally special to me. I remember him because he was just such a solid Jamaican man, so grounded, so humble, so caring, so wise, so astute, and um, he was always willing to share with you if you are willing to allow him to. If you get a chance, you've got to read that book, They Call Me Teacher. It's a biography of Sir Howard, and it's really an easy read, a very, very pleasant read. The Life and Times of Sir Howard Cook, written by uh, Jackie Ranston, and uh, more of that book an uh, anon. Um, he was really born on October 15, 1915, but like so many persons uh, from that era, he wasn't registered until about a month later. So his official birth date is November 13, 1915, which is what uh, all official documents would carry. But I know many Jamaicans of a certain age can identify with what I just shared. So the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition meeting with members of the family at this time. And just give to give you a timeline on Sir Howard's career. You know, for 23 years he served as a teacher. Yes, and you can bet where that career started at the Michael College practice, and practicing school. And then we know he spoke so very highly of the experience he had at Bell Castle All Age School in Port Antonio, the Port Antonio Upper School and the Montego Bay Boys School. There are many people from Portland who speak so highly of their contact with Sir Howard Cook. He entered politics in 1938, and that was a time when Jamaica was moving towards self-government and the formation of parties. And he was a founding member of the People's National Party. He's, he was a member of the executive and the national executive, and chairman of the regional executive, and eventually chairman of the party. In 1958, Sir Howard was elected to the West Indies Federal Parliament as a representative for St. James. He entered the Jamaican Parliament in 1962 and served as a senator until early 1967. He served as a member of the House of Representatives between 67 and 1980 and was a minister of government between 72 and 1980. As minister, he held at different times the portfolios of pensions and social security, education, labor, and the public service. He was president of the Senate from 1989 to 1991 and served on the executive of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. There are some really interesting stories about this man, how magnanimous he was. There was an election Would campaign. the congregation please stand? in which he loaned a car to a member of the opposition. And now the service begins. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
things beyond our hearing, things beyond our imagining, have all been prepared by God for those who love him. In his favor, there is life. Tears may linger at nightfall, but rejoicing comes in the morning. We all know that God's judgment is just. And do you imagine that you will escape the judgment of God? Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Souls of the righteous are in God's hands. No torment will touch them. They are at peace. Let's begin our service of thanksgiving for the life of the late Sir Howard Cook as we sing to God's glory and praise. Praise my soul. The King of Heaven. remain standing for the litany of praise. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, God is in the midst of her 
she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The prayer of adoration and thanksgiving being delivered by Reverend Everald Galbraith, President of the Jamaica Council of Churches. Let us pray. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of all life, the Alpha and the Omega, the source of all power, giver of all good and perfect gifts, all praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you that because of your unconditional love for all creation, you became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. He lived our life, bore our griefs, and died our death upon the cross. You vindicated him by raising him from the dead, and in him we have life and life everlasting. Eternal God, in your wisdom and grace, you have given us joy through the lives of your departed servants. We thank you for your child and servant, Howard, whom we today lay to rest. We are grateful for the joy, encouragement, hope, and blessing his life has brought to others. Lord, we thank you for Brother Howard's service to the people of Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the wider world community through education, religion, politics, and community development. Thank you for every happy remembrance of his life. God of purpose and design. You have closed Brother Howard's earthly pilgrimage and responsibilities. The tribulations of this world are over and death itself is past. Compassionate God, we thank you for your goodness and mercy that accompanied and attended Brother Howard's life all the days of his life. We bless you that your goodness and mercy is with everyone. And we pray that, like How Brother Howard, others will experience and spread your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus, our elder brother, friend, and savior. Amen. Conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. That was the Apostles' Creed. The service will now continue unannounced. There will be five tributes in this service. The first three will be in this section, and the first one will be, led, will be given by Reverend Norbert Stevens, General Secretary of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. Members of the Cook family, his Excellency, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, Governor General, the Most Honorable Portia Simpson Miller, Prime Minister, and the Most Honorable Mr. Everett Miller, Mr. Andrew Holness, Leader of the Opposition, and Mrs. Holness, Honorable McKeever Bush, Leader of the Opposition, Cayman Islands, members of the Cabinet, Senator Floyd Morris, President of the Senate, and Mrs. Morris, the Honorable Mrs. Justice McCullough, Chief Justice, and Mr. McCullough, Ministers of State, the Most Honorable Mrs. Michael Manley, the Honorable Douglas Saunders, Cabinet Secretary, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, members of the Judiciary, Permanent Secretaries, Major General Anthony Anderson, Chief of Defense Staff, Mr. Clifford Blake, representing Mr. Glenmore Hines, Acting Commissioner of Police, the Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble Bloomfield, moderator of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. The Reverend Everett Galbraith, President, Jamaica Council of Churches and Chairman, Jamaica District of Methodist Churches. The Reverend Dr. Lenworth Anglin, Chair of the Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches. The Reverend Dr. Midland Evans, President of the International University of the Caribbean. The Most Honorable Charles DeFore, Roman Catholic Archbishop of Kingston, the Most Honorable Reverend Edgerton Clark, and the Most Reverend Honorable Donald Rees, and other ecumenical ministers and partners, specially invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands is pleased to pay tribute to the life and witness of Sir Howard Felix Hanlon Cook, the third native Governor General of Jamaica, faithful member of the denomination and diligent servant of God. Throughout his near 99 years of life, he consistently modeled a profile that could be regarded as a genuine reflection of the nostalgic rumination of the 19th century poet, Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, then you'll be a man, my son. Sir Howard's association with the United Church may be said to have been lifelong, given the, life, the location of his birth, Goodwill St. James, a Presbyterian free village established through the ministry of the late Reverend George Blythe of the Scottish Missionary Society. In offering a description of the village, the Jamaica National Heritage Trust website notes in the township, gambling, liquor stores, and concubinage were not tolerated. In addition, only members of the Temperance Society were allowed to possess property. 
the standards established by the first residents of this village unquestionably had a profoundly enduring impact on this man. Notwithstanding the fact that he became a member of that community nearly 80 years after its establishment. Such values proved to be an immense source of influence with respect to the contribution he would eventually make at every level of personal engagement. Sir Howard served the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands and its antecedents in a wide variety of ways. These include being Sunday school teacher, organist, elder, lay preacher, delegate and chair of council, delegate to synod. Following his retirement from representational politics, along with his colleague across the parliamentary, parliamentary aisle, the late former parliamentarian Arthur Williams, among others, he was elevated to the office of lay pastor. Teacher Cook, as Sir Howard was widely and affectionately called, began his service in an era which there was no sharp dis distinction or separation of church and school. In fact, it was in an era in which the three pillars on which community were built and through which human development was sustained were the home, the school, and the church. It was an era in which the teacher was more often than not the church organist and Sunday school superintendent and almost always an official assistant to the pastor. Whether it was in the church with which the school in which he was employed was associated or in the church in which he chose to give expression of his Christian faith and service, Sir Howard was generous in the offering of the skills and abilities required for the aforementioned duties. His eventual transition to another vocation did not witness a withdrawal of this commitment, but rather evidence a steadfast engagement in what he was clearly convinced was a path to which he had been called. It was this that oftentimes saw him taking time off from cabinet duties to share, however briefly, in the deliberations of the Synod. While he occupied the office of Governor General, he served under the then Central Executive, the Church's highest decision-making body outside of Synod. His attendance, his attendance, not to mention his participation at such meetings, was regular and sustained. His participation in the Synod's work was not only at the philosophical or theological level, but he gave practical expression to his conviction and commitment through his outstanding contribution to the development of the Farm Heights Congregation and the adjoining early childhood institution named in his honor. He also played a pivotal role in the launch and life of the Lay Persons Initiative, and he served as chair of that arm of the church. During his time at King's House, Sunday after Sunday, he laid aside the regalia of head of state to don the robe and stole of lay pastor. Because for him, his elevation to the highest civic office, open to a citizen of this nation, did not signal the necessity of withdrawal from service to God through the Farm Heights congregation. The folk in this faith community will tell you that in those years, the GG was nothing more than the embodiment of teacher or Pastor Cook of the pre-King's House era. While Sir Howard was unambiguous in his commitment as an ardent Christian, he was not arrogant, neither was parochial nor a religious bigot. He enjoyed discourse with persons of other religious persuasions, whether Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Rastafari, or any other. It was for him a privilege to be thus engaged. He was respectful of others and their opinions, almost to a fault. As a result, he gained the respect and admiration of so many. He demonstrated an uncommon appreciation of the richness of the religious diversity that marks the Jamaican reality. 
It is hardly surprising that in partnership with the Reverend Ashley Smith and the late Professor Ajay Mansing, he was co-founder of the Jamaica Council for Interfaith Fellowship. His interfaith endeavor was clearly demonstrated in the fact that he was inclusive, consistently shunning the more popular tendency to be exclusionary. In the process, he had a way of enlisting the support of others in the ecumenical enterprise. For example, although Lady Cook was not a member of the United Church, he occasionally enlisted her activities, not always reserved for, but normally expected of members of the denomination. She was recruited and served as teacher in the Sunday school that was a precursor to the Farm Heights congregation. Sir Howard was part of the visioning team for the establishment and expansion of the International University of the Caribbean, an institution of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, and served with diligence and distinction as its first chancellor. On a wider national or international level, Sir Howard was an avid supporter of initiatives of change, the successor of moral rearmament. Its theology was simple and conservative. It featured surrender to Jesus Christ and sharing with others whose lives had been changed in pursuit of four moral attributes, purity, unselfishness, honesty, and love. Without doubt, the ideals of the goodwill movement served to facilitate the choice of his engagement with initiatives of change. Like all other human beings, Sir Howard lived an imperfect life, marked by the limitation that are, limitations that are characteristic of our being human. It can nevertheless be said, without fear of contradiction, that he lived a positively exemplary life, that he witnessed a good confession. The United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands celebrates his life, celebrates his witness, and the almost unassuming Gargantian contribution to the development of church and country. To him, we simply declare, well done. To his widow, the very supportive Lady Cook, their daughter Audrey, and their sons Howard Jr. and Richard, the Synod extends its heartfelt sympathy and the assurance of God's comforting presence in the ensuing days. May the soul of our brother rest in peace and light perpetual shine upon him. The Reverend Norbert Stevens, General Secretary of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, bringing the first of three tributes in this section. Now, Mr. Walter Scott, QC, District Grand Lodge of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, will bring his tribute. The Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, Governor General. The Most Honorable Lady Allen. The Most Honorable Portia Simpson Miller, Prime Minister. The Most Honorable Errol Miller. The Honorable Andrew Holness, Leader of the Opposition. Members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Their Lordships in the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal. Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, family, ladies and gentlemen, brethren. The Most Honorable Sir Howard Cook was the epitome of all that is good, true, and virtuous of English Freemasonry. He was initiated in the Friendly Lodge number 383 in Montego Bay on the 14th day of July, 1955, long before I was born. His public and private lives were characterized by moral and religious rectitude, were adorned by seemingly endless charity and benevolence, and were clothed in a virtuous and an upright existence. Despite his learning and elevated status, he was blessed with the ability to treat each man or woman on the level as equals. 
Shortly after his initiation, the initiate into Freemasonry is given a charge where he is told the following. Let prudence direct you, temperance clothe you, fortitude support you, and justice be the guide of all of your actions. I dare say that every Jamaican who has had any interaction with Sir Howard will honestly admit and concede that the virtues of prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice were all hallmarks of the man they knew as teacher. Our craft enjoins us all as Freemasons to unite in the grand design of being happy and in communicating happiness. Sir Howard was not only a happy man, but he spent most of his adult life trying to communicate happiness to all with whom he interacted. He did so never at the expense of principle, but always with humility, a ready smile, and a twinkle in his eyes. In summary, his life was not just symbolic of, but represented all of the Masonic virtues. His passion for training and in improving the knowledge base of each individual is now legendary. He brought these passions to his Freemasonry. On the occasions when I was privileged to have a private conversation with him, I always came away wiser. Although he spent a lifetime in politics, he was never partisan in the way that, regrettably, we have come to know and accept that word. This lack of partisanship was no doubt inspired by his Masonic life, where men from all political parties sit together and enjoy their Freemasonry in complete harmony and unity. At the time of his very sad and lamentable passing, Sir Howard was the fourth most senior English Mason in the island. This was a rank he bore with the humility reserved for only the truly great. Sir Howard lived very well respected and has died deeply regretted. May his soul rest in peace. Representing the District Grand Lodge of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, Mr. Walter H. Scott QC. And now we have, representing the Jamaica Teachers Association, the President, Dr. Mark Nicely. Distinguished congregation all, pleasant morning. Tribute to the most honorable Sir Howard Cook, consummate educator. Of all the personal accomplishments and the many accolades that we conferred on Sir Howard Felix Hanlon Cook in his lifetime, the name teacher was undoubtedly one of the designations that he cherished most. Sir Howard was in fact the consummate educator. In his 23 years of outstanding and selfless service in the classroom and as an administrator, as well as mentor and guide for students, teachers, parents, and the wider community, he helped to reshape the life of countless persons. And in the process, earned national recognition as a pioneer and standard bearer for excellence in education. Reflecting on his career, in an interview for his biography, God is Good, from the Cane Fields to King's House, Sir Howard noted that he was not a born teacher, and he recounted his dismal performance in his first class as a teacher while in teacher training at Michael College in 1930. However, he subsequently developed a love for teaching, which he explained as followed. If you are looking 
for that things that can change people and help them grow, things that make people happy. It is exciting, end quote. The excellent education he received at the Michael College honed his leadership skills and equipped him to be the catalyst for change as headmaster, community leader, lay pastor, as well as through his various portfolios in public office. He was awarded the Duff Memorial Prize for his all-round performance in his final year at the Michael. And one month after graduation, he assumed duties as junior master teaching sports and agriculture. He also served as acting headmaster for the prestigious Michael Practicing School, while the principal pursued studies overseas. In those days, this was the most outstanding elementary school in Jamaica. And though Howard Cook was the youngest of the approximately 30 to 35 members on staff, he won the cooperation of both staff and students. He recalls as one of his proud achievements having coached the school choir, which placed second in its first year at the Festival of Arts. However, it was as principal of Bell Castle Elementary School in Portland, where he served as principal for 11 years, that Sir Howard gave tangible expression to his vision of preparing pupils for practical everyday life and his ultimate objective of making each person better. Ably supported by his wife, Ivy, a graduate of Bethlehem Teachers College, he became an integral part of this deep rural community. He was teacher, preacher, farmer, legal advisor, and counselor. They developed a new curriculum consistent with the needs of the community. Lady Cook taught mathematics, English, sewing, and craft work, while he specialized in agriculture and music, working with both students and residents. At the end of his tenure, Bell Castle was ranked as an A-grade institution. Sir Howard also contributed to the development of other schools in the parish, including Happy Grove Secondary School, where he was sports master, and Teachfield Upper School in Portland, before heading back to his home parish, St. James, where he was appointed principal of the Montego Bay Boys School. Diagnostic testing to facilitate the use of appropriate teaching methodologies for pupils were considered who were considered backward. The introduction of subjects such as Spanish, algebra, geometry, and the sciences, as well as classes in tourism-related matters. The establishment of a thriving school farm and a school feeding program were among teachers' cook many innovations. These, along with the formation of a scout's troop, participation in the Festival of Arts and the launch of the National Festival Movement, which he spearheaded, ensured the rounded development of his students and changed the face of the community. Howard Cook's deep concern to improve the welfare of his peers, his commitment to community development, and his recognition of the role of the teacher as a leader in this process, his deep involvement in the community where he worked and undergirded his affinity for social activism. Through his instrumentality, several community centers and citizen organizations were established in East Portland and St. James. While still a student at the Michael, he joined the Teachers Association and he was elected as the president of the St. Andrew chapter at the tender age of 21. 
his strong and consistent advocacy on behalf of the profession won him the presidency of the Jamaica Union of Teachers, JUT, in 1958. Even as he pursued his political career as a member of the federal parliament, in this era, he founded the East Portland Association, which was later renamed the Federation of Teachers. This stalwart for education was in the vanguard of the movement which led to the unification of five teachers' union to form the now Jamaica Teachers Association in 1964. As a proud life member of the JTA, Sir Howard insisted on casting his vote in the annual presidential election, a right he exercised up to 2013. He firmly believed that the JUT and the JTA revolutionized the education system, and he constantly promoted the achievements of teachers and their contribution to national development, which he said were often overlooked. Sir Howard's tremendous experience and his achievements, both in the classroom and the wider society, as well as his vision for education and national development, made him a logical choice as Minister of Education. A portfolio he held from 1974 to 1976. Shortly after taking office, he established the Nutrition Products Limited in recognition of the link between academic performance and nutrition. Under his watch, guidance counselors were introduced into secondary schools and junior secondary schools were converted to new secondary institutions with the inclusion of grades 10 and 11. Another major policy change was the establishment of the first four community colleges in Jamaica. Knox Community College, Excelsa Community College, Brownstown Community College, and Montego Bay Community College. In 1976, a special rural education trust was implemented in six elementary primary schools, three agriculture schools, and a teaching institution, and a program for community development was formulated. Although he had retired from active teaching when he took office as Governor General in 1991, Sir Howard Cook maintained his zest for education. And it was not unusual for him to visit a school unannounced and conduct a class much to the delight of staff and students. In 1993, he became the first patron of the Roll of Honor Awards, which since 1997 has been presented to educators for outstanding service in the classroom community, nation, and the JTA. He also signed the first proclamation of the JTA annual Read Across Jamaica Day, which was launched in 2005 to promote reading as a catalyst for academic success. Sir Howard has served our profession with passion, integrity, and humility, and his legacy will stand for generations. His commitment to education remains unabated to the very end. It was our very special honor on Teacher's Day, May 5th, 2014, to present this distinguished JTA life member and Lady Cook with the commemorative pin marking the 50th anniversary of the association which they served with great loyalty. We extend our sincerest condolences to Lady Cook and the members of Sir Howard's family. May his soul rest in peace. The third of three tributes at this time in the order of service. And now the congregation will prepare for the singing of the hymn, How Great Thou Art.
And now we have uh, the second set of tributes. The Prime Minister, the most honorable, Portia Simpson Miller, will begin, and then that will be followed by the grandchildren. Members of the clergy, Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Lady Ivy Cook, and members of the family, His Excellency, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, Governor General, and Her Excellency, Lady Allen, who sent her excuse, she could not be here today. Most Honorable Harold Miller, Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Andrew Hones, Honorable Makiva Bush, coming in from the Cayman Islands. And I want to recognize the presence of former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Edward Siago, and Mrs. Siago, and the Honorable Bruce Golding and Mrs. Golding. Members of the Cabinet, President of the Senate, Speaker of the House of Representatives, our former Governor General, former Prime Ministers, I mentioned before, the Chief Justice, President of the Court of Appeal, Ministers of State, President of the Jamaica Council of Churches, the Most Honorable Glenn Manley, the Most Honorable Denise Aldemeyer Scherer, the Cabinet Secretary, Your Excellencies, the Head of Foreign Service, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, High Commissioners and Ambassadors, members of the Privy Council, members of the Senate, members of the House of Representatives, our Judges of the Court of Appeal, Judges of the Supreme Court, Chairman of the Public Service Commission, Chief of Defense Staff, and Mr. Clifford Blake, representing the Commissioner of Police, Mayors and Chairman of Parish Councils, Custodies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Beauty, truth, and rarity. Grace in all simplicity. Hair enclosed in cinders lie. These words from the Shakespearean sonnet evoke only the tip of the iceberg as we ponder the life of a man who gave true meaning to the word Colossus. Like a Colossus, he did bestride the educational and business sector, as well as the political landscape of Jamaica and the Caribbean. On reflection, there are few people who have had a more profound influence on the course of modern Jamaican history and society like Sir Howard Cook. His selfless service to Jamaica included active participation as athlete, educator, administrator, and social worker. He excelled as a salesman, business manager, and clergyman. He served his people as a trade unionist, political pioneer, strategist and teacher of political strategy, and grassroots organizer, and a political leader of what many called the Republic of Western Jamaica. His representation spanned several sectors, and in particular education. As representative of his people, he was in the West Indian Federal Parliament. He was a parliamentarian in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, and he was a Minister of Government and represented both the Queen as Head of State and the people of Jamaica when he served as Governor General. Known as teacher, this educator for 23 years taught not only academic subjects in various schools, beginning with his alma mater, the Michael College, and its practicing school. He also taught by precept and example in his various duties, which he undertook in his long life. Among the indelible lessons 
he shared were compassion, tolerance, and fairness. Sir Howard had a natural empathy with and caring spirit for the vast majority of persons with whom he interfaced. None could fail to be moved by his warmth, his broad and daring smile, and his generosity of spirit. These were the fundamental qualities that caused the young Howard Cook to become involved in the foundational social activism provided through Jamaica Welfare before he became involved in the activism of party politics. Jamaica Welfare provided his foray into the realm of service, bringing education, health services, pediatric care, community development tools, and the principle of self-reliance to the masses of our people. Later, Sir Howard was very much in the vanguard of the nationalist movement of the 1930s and was a founding member of the People's National Party in 1938. Joining, belonging to, and working for a progressive movement was for Howard Cook, a man motivated by the development of his people, the quintessential manifestation of providing power for the people and power by the people. The political movement of the PNP provided a vehicle through which that band of nationalists led by Norman Washington Manley set about the arduous task, the long, strong march towards building a society anchored in the fundamental values of industry, honesty, truth, commitment to country, and equality for all. This movement had amongst its objectives universal adult suffrage. Together, they demanded the right to self-determination by popular democratic franchise. They also sought self-government, advocating for and negotiating the sovereignty of the new Jamaican nation. Through his early assertion of nationalist sentiment and his unquenchable nation-building fervor, Sir Howard Cook was undoubtedly one of the pioneers of the new Jamaica. We are out to build a new Jamaica was their personal anthem and the journeyman song. We are out to build a new Jamaica was the rallying cry that caused them to work fervently for the right to vote, educational opportunities, decent work, fair wages, ownership of the means of production, and the right to health care and other essential social services. We are out to build a new Jamaica encompassed the deep-rooted desire to achieve the inalienable right to every Jamaican man, woman, and child to basic necessities of life and to build Jamaica they did. From administration to administration, from the Ministry of Pensions, Social Security, and Labor to the Education Ministry, over a period spanning several decades, Sir Howard participated in advocacy and representation, the development of legislation, and a range of policy initiatives that saw Jamaica's social transformation from crown colony to independent nation state and beyond through an area of social transformation. Additionally, when the real history of Modern Caribbean regional integration is written, which was in his day, and is still argued about, Howard Cook will stand tall. He remained a consummate regionalist who shared the vision of a unified Caribbean people. Along with Norman Washington Manley and a small band of committed federalists, 
he worked long and hard to realize that vision as they toiled onwards. As a politician, teacher was one of a kind. It would not be an exaggeration to say that he knew the majority of his constituents by name. His proven campaign strategy was simple. Walk, sit and talk with every elector on the voters list. Of course, being blessed with the memory of an elephant, he could, even in his 90s, recall the usual voting pattern of almost every family in St. James. It is difficult to contemplate the People's National Party without Howard Cook. His organizational work in extending the reach of the party from the small nucleus of early nationalists to a popular national grassroots organization representing every sector of the society is legendary. Teacher Cook's brutal honesty was enfolded in a disarming charm. His interventions have served as both the conscience of the party and the glue that has helped to hold it together in times of divergent tensions. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Howard has been and remains a source of inspiration for many generations. Having been barred from entering the grounds of King's House when he was a scout at the age of 17, Sir Howard would be chauffeur-driven to triumphantly, yet humbly, take up residence in the same King's House as Governor General of Jamaica on Emancipation Day 1991 at the age of 75. Among the most enduring life lessons taught to us by Teacher Cook himself is that there are no heights of achievement to which the poorest and the most humble Jamaican cannot rise if we work hard and live a life of utmost integrity. His was a journey from the slave barracks of Goodwill Estate to where he was born, to being the restorer of the governor's mansion, mansion the governor's mansion at King's House as governor general. While never denying his varied ancestral influences, Sir Howard would give practical expression to his authentic Fanti African heritage, which is known for its tradition of farming and political leadership. So deep did the farming tradition run in Sir Howard's blood that while he was GG, even the chickens, cows, goats and rabbits made the triumphant trek with him to King's House. Not to mention the 110 fruit trees of all types, including mango, ackee, breadfruit, oranges, many others, which were to transform the King's House landscape for the better. Sir Howard's was a life of teaching, giving, and built him. Sir Howard embraced all and was a model of inclusiveness and nonpartisanship. Sir Howard's was a life of service. Sir Howard's was a life of selflessness. His traditions of service have permeated his family, who we thank profusely for having so generously shared him with us, a grateful nation. His dear beautiful wife of many decades, some 75 years, in fact, Her Excellency, the most honorable Lady Ivy Cook, who toiled with him in the vineyard of education and the many communities which together they served. He said of Lady Ivy, from the day his eyes met hers, he knew he was going to marry her. His sons also continued to serve their respective communities 
Honorable Mr. Justice Howard Fitzarthur Cook and Mr. Richard Washington Cook, noted hotelier, and his daughter, Miss Audrey Faith Cook, a former diplomat, representative of Jamaica, and counselor. The government and people of Jamaica share your pain at the passing of your loved one, husband, father, grandfather, brother, and friend. Our condolences are laden with gratitude and our final farewell full of love for someone who stands tall in our memories as one of Jamaica's most illustrious sons and one of our gentlest souls. Sir Howard has passed on from this life. Our beloved teacher has ended his earthly sojourn. His memory shall live in our hearts and his work shall shine on in the life of our nation. We are saddened by his death, but inspired by his example and refreshed by his overwhelming humanity. In ultimate tribute to a pioneering son of Jamaica, and a valiant champion in battle, today I summon but a small portion of his characteristic courage from the words of an unknown poet that urge us to be strong. He said, even in our grief, there's quiet pride that loved ones bravely fought and died. Believing in a worthy goal, give solace, comfort, and consoles, knowing that the loss we bear is shared by our peoples where in gratitude all our people, their names will be uttered by those they left full free, forever honored, remembered, and enshrined beyond the shifting sand of time. Walk good, my mentor and my friend. May your soul find sweet eternal rest, and may the light of the Lord shine graciously, mercifully, and perpetually on your gentle, caring soul. Thank you. The most honorable Portia Simpson Miller paying her tribute to Sir Howard Cook. And now, grandchildren, Dr. Howard Cook. Grandpa. My darling, my little lump of sweetness. <laughs> we'll always remember that. Members of the clergy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are strengthened today because we are convinced that our grandfather's work here is done. Even if I look further, no further than the walls of this church, I know that every seed that Grandpa was destined to plant has been planted. And those seeds that he was destined to water have been well watered. The foundations that he was destined to lay have been laid. The lessons that he was destined to teach have been taught. The torch that he was destined to carry has illuminated every dark place it was put there to light. We all lived with our grandparents during our formative years and were blessed with the opportunity to benefit from his teaching skills. Our home at Peter Pan Avenue was both home and school and Grandpa regarded every moment with us as an opportunity to teach. Whether we were sitting by the kitchen watching Grandma cook and bake, or just sharing in his recliner before falling asleep, Grandpa would teach. Every lesson was wrapped in love, 
and I am so grateful for every nurturing moment. And those sessions were made even more pleasant for him if he got a head rub. And for those of you that know him well, that was mostly caressing his scalp as his hairline had receded, leaving a tuft of hair above his ears and the nape of his neck. But I am most grateful for his loving impact on me as a, as a little boy at our ancestral home on Peter Pan Avenue in Montego Bay. You see, for the first time, for the first nine years of my life, I was grandpa and grandma's round the clock pupil and a handy sampler of his passion for making sure the creative genius in everyone gets, gets, gets to express itself. My grandfather has fulfilled the role of my father. He was the most genuine, kind, virtuous, and honorable man I have ever known. He was really my only friend. No one in my life has ever treated me the way that man did. He showed me how to be, how to be the humble boss while demonstrating respect towards others, their opinions, and their life situations, whatever they may be. Oftentimes he would remind me, you must always be twice as good as the next man, but also twice as humble. On the topic of humility, never have I seen a man with so much power just be easy, to use a common Jamaican expression. That within, that within itself was one of the greatest lessons he ever taught me. Our grandpa taught us how to read, how to multiply. Grandpa gave me my first copy of the Hardy Boys. I loved those wild adventures those Hardy Boys went on. And with grandpa's guidance, I learned to dig, detect, explore, pay attention, and persist until the mystery was solved. Grandpa set me on the summer task of learning my times tables before the summer was over. We were taught other fundamental skills, such as how to write letters to our, uh, um, such as how to write letters, and our grandparents ensured that we corresponded with our parents overseas. There was no internet then, yet alone cell phones, and making long distance calls was a premium cost. If anyone gave trouble in their childhood years, it was me. But if anyone saw past that and always reassured me of the good, goodness and potential within me, it was my grandpa. I was a little different. Not only did I spend my formative years with my grandpa, I was fortunate to have spent approximately 80% of my life around grandpa. And I'm ever so grateful to have done so. You see, Grandpa was a leader by example. He could teach you about life without even saying a word. And sometimes you really didn't want him to say anything, especially if you were in the wrong. Grandpa, Grandpa taught us honesty and good moral values. One day while we were playing, my brother was chasing me with a burning egg box. Being younger, I got tired and stopped abruptly. And he ran into me. I sustained a burn to my forearm. On getting home that evening, naturally, Grandpa was curious as to what had happened. My brother tried to fabricate a story, but it made no sense. And in a true traditional way, he got a flogging. So from early, we knew that honesty was the best policy. We knew our grandfather loved us, but he was not afraid to punish us. The instant fall of his bottom lip, sometimes it even trembled, was a clear indicator that we had done something wrong and we should correct it immediately. We had fun times with Grandpa. 
We'd cut coconuts together, cut callaloo, pick mangoes, name it, we did it. Grandpa taught us life skills. These prepared us to live and work anywhere in the world. He would season a lesson in a heartbeat with the wit of the poet Rudyard Kipling more than once. I'd hear him say, Nando, if you can walk with kings nor lose the common touch, you will be a man, my son. Grandpa showed us as much as he taught us about relationships. And most of the lessons we gleaned was just from watching the way that he treated Grandma. Papa taught us how to swim at Dr. Scaife Beach. He would take us to the beach in the mornings before he went to work. And even after the frustration of not catching on at the first, and the burning sensation of nose filled with salty water, he motivated us to persist. And so we learned swimming, an important life skill at a very young age. Nando went on to eventually captain the swimming team at Campion College. We learned the value of practice, dedication, doing your best, and striving for excellence. Those lessons, however, paled in comparison with the lessons about giving to others and giving back to the community. He would always say, never hesitate to give. You will always receive tenfold. We were encouraged to share with our friends and cousins. I can recall carrying baskets of homegrown produce over to our neighbors. I would enjoy going with Grandpa for a drive out. He would put on his straw hat, and I, being the child, sat in the back of the car. In those days, the seat, the seat belt rules were not that strict, and I would stand so that I could see through the window. And we would drive through different communities, and I would marvel at how everybody knew him. I was also so fascinated by how he got so many hellos, and that he constantly left his hand up in the greeting position. And of course, wanting to emulate, I tried it too. He was loved, and he showed love, care, and concern for others. I watched him give grandma tender loving care, patience, hugs, treats, pinches, and that same listening ear that he gave me. I also saw the tenfold return as my grandmother would lavish papa with loving attention, wisdom, the best fruit juices, and hmm, the best homemade desserts. He had a sweet tooth. We are grateful for their example. In our interactions, he shared many lessons, some of which constantly resonate within me. One, never let a man know what you are thinking. Never let him know how to press your buttons. You are better off than you realize. Do not allow people that cannot affect your life to do so. Even when you know someone may be taking you for a ride, you do not have to express it. All that is important is that you are aware. Know your value and do not let yourself be abused because of the kindness of your heart. These lessons are only but a few that have helped me to change my perspective and reactions to situations over the years. From an early age, Grandpa would listen challenge and validate my thinking. So often that by the time I finished high school at Campion, he supported, even encouraged my desire to go to university thousands of miles away from home. 
Grandpa knew that he had given me the tools to stand anywhere, and I'm so grateful that he did. Grandpa continues, continued to give us guidance and support throughout our lives. He participated in our joys and successes and was a tower of strength during our sad moments. As we blossomed in our careers, he constantly reminded us never to forget the human element, the gentle touch and compassion for others. <clears throat> Some persons wonder why I get up if seated when greeting a lady, why I always say good day to anyone I encounter, why I open doors for ladies, why I always say please and thank you, and why I exercise tact as well as diplomacy before, in, before saying anything to anyone. The reason is simple. I was taught by one of the finest old school gentlemen that ever lived. I look back now and say, God is good for having placed that man around me and having his counsel for so many years into my adulthood. In the latter years of his life, we became very close and that was when I really understood what, it, what having a real father around really means. It really takes the selfishness out of your heart when you have to take care of someone in their elderly years who in your youth you believe to be indestructible. It also fills your heart with pride when a man such as Grandpa says, you have changed, you are on a better path, but learn to chat less and listen more. Almost every positive attribute I have is from my grandfather. We believe that in the 98 years that grandpa was here, he effectively touched, listened to, reasoned with, challenged, caressed, encouraged, shared a hearty laugh with everyone he was destined to reach. So much so that after Grandpa retired as the Governor General, he maintained an active life and remained accessible to all. Grandma would often remark, he has not retired, he has retired. It was during the latter years that he spent time sharing his life story with me and telling me how Jamaica had developed and reassuring me of the progress we had made as a nation. Memories I will always treasure. As we stand before you today, even with a saddened heart. Please know that we have been honed and raised by the best. We can stand tall and play our part to continue his legacy because our foundation is so strong. We will always treasure Grandpa's love and lessons. And my hope is that none of us will allow Grandpa's contribution to be in vain. Let this day be a day of new beginnings, of mending, and may each of us complete with loving excellence, like our Grandpa, the work we are destined to do. I wish to thank the medical team friends and family members who provided grandpa with care. I wish to specially thank Rosie and Miralda for the patience and care that they demonstrated to our grandpa. Grandpa, uh, we, love, we you. love you. May, May your soul, soul rest, rest in, in peace. peace. A most touching tribute from grandchildren, Dr. Howard Cook, Dr. Tasha Cook Davis, and Mr. Alberta Cook. They have testified that who they are today 
is a direct result of the influence of their grandfather, who we know as the Governor General of Jamaica, former Governor General, the Most Honorable Sir Howard Felix Handon Cook. And now we, pre we prepare for the first lesson, which will be taken from Psalm 1. His Excellency, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, Governor General, will read. A reading from the Word of God, from the Hebrew text, Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The word of the Lord. That was the Hebrew text, Psalm 1, read by His Excellency, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, Governor General. The second lesson will be the Revelation of St. John, and this is Revelation 7, verse 9 to 17. This lesson will be read by the leader of the opposition, Mr. Andrew Holness. A reading from the book of Revelations, chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. 
the revelation of St. John, Revelation 7, verse 9 through 17, which was read by the leader of the opposition, Mr. Andrew Holness. And now we prepare for the remembrance, which will be delivered by former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson. I think this was a special request by the former Governor General that this remembrance be done by Mr. Patterson, who is now escorted to the platform. It was the last occasion at King's House in October 2005 when the Governor General would be presenting the national awards for the last time during that stint. Lady Cook, who was sitting beside me, whispered, Howard will be 90 next month. But believe me, the man is no ordinary 90. With that glint in her eye, I had no reason to ask her what she meant. For by any test or measure, irrespective of the sphere or criteria for passing judgment, Howard Felix Hanlon Cook was indeed no ordinary man. As a teacher, a preacher, a salesman, a community leader, a father, as a nation builder, he was extraordinary but most of all he was a fine human being when he began his earthly journey he was to share space and time with a small number of persons who had actually been born into slavery so the legacy of centuries of human exploitation was a part of the actuality of his earliest years. Up to age 11, the young Howard indulged in his favorite pastimes, horseback riding, playing marbles, and you would not believe he was the village pugilist. He displayed a tendency to rebelliousness, which led him to do everything except attending school regularly. In desperation, his mother packed him off to Grange Hill Elementary School, where he became one of 12 boys boarding with the legendary headmaster, Frank Theophilus Sinclair. Teacher Sinclair soon straightened him out. And as mentor and father, young Howard began devoting his considerable intellect and energy to a mastery of academics, agriculture, and the performing arts. In January 1933, Howard Cook made his way to Kingston one of the 120 hopefuls competing for only 20 places who would enter the Michael. He was put through a grueling two-day written and oral examination from which he emerged as the first in his class. He entered the Michael as a confident, articulate, academically competent young man nurtured in Christian values with a love for rural Jamaica. He was not about to submit to the ragging and bullying that was the French 
freshman's lot at Michael. And so he immediately organized his peers to carry the fight to the seniors. In the pitched battle that ensued, Cook and his Frenchmen, and his freshmen also, gave a good account of themselves. So much so that the following week, four seniors who had identified this young upstart as the ringleader waylaid and taught the grub a painful lesson. Young Howard bided his time. He planned his retaliation and executed it methodically by tackling each one of the four in due turn. In the words of the good book, he smoked them, he smote them separately, hip and thigh. Howard Cook's ability to lead was quickly recognized in every sphere of endeavor. Although the youngest, he was selected the senior student for his batch and chosen to teach the first lesson at the practicing school. He was already a fine cricketer, but as a country boy, had never played football. He eventually captained both teams, as he subsequently did later when he returned to St. James. It was the quality of his performance at the Micro Training College and his willingness to challenge traditional approaches which branded him early as a leader, a progressive thinker, and an activist prepared to give unstinting service in any endeavor to which he was committed. This was the most intense period of ferment and change in Jamaica's history. For three weeks in the 1938 Labour Rebellion, the Jamaican working people brought the colonial administration to its knees. Out of the ferment sprung the opening to launch a party as the national vehicle to unite all democratic organizations and one de dedicated to the idea of developing Jamaica as a whole. Howard Cook was burning with a fervor to be part of that progressive movement. One pledge to the fight for adult suffrage, self-government, and particularly appealing to Howard, one committed to upward social mobility. At 23 years of age, he was chosen to be a pioneer that would help to draft the Constitution and design the policy framework of the People's National Party. What he had achieved before his 24th birthday, few managed to accomplish in their entire lifetime. With the social, economic, and industrial fabric in tatters, the young Howard Cook was inspired to share his skills and energies with those who wanted to fashion a new and better Jamaica. He was regarded as what nowadays would be called a young face man. And with that honoring eye for pulchritude, he found, selected, and married the radiant and brilliant teacher, Ivy Sylvia Lucille Tai. It was indeed the first marriage to be celebrated in the Michael College Chapel 75 years ago, and they remained perfect and loving partners until the very end. On his appointment as head teacher of Bell Castle All Age, he dedicated himself to molding the lives of children whose future would open doors of opportunity not envisaged by them or their parents. The teachers then 
unlike now, received only a meager salary. To offset that, Howard purchased hundreds of coconuts and gave them to the villagers to boil oil. He asked for nothing in return except the cuddy water and trash, which he then fed to his pigs and his chickens. The income from that enabled him to provide for his family and also extend private tuition free of cost to all ambitious pupils. He was born to teach. He was always searching for innovative ways to make children learn. He believed that teachers and the education institutions were critical foundations to raise national consciousness and in charting our own course to create a new independent relationship with the rest of the world. He commanded and earned total respect. While at Barracks Road School, he caned a boy for being late and sent him home. The boy went home and complained to his father, who decided to accompany his son to the school and berate the headmaster. Howard was not daunted. He gave the father a fine caning also and ordered him to return home and be a better parent. Building communities was the central purpose of his activities. Whether as teacher, member of parliament, as insurance executive or as a lay preacher. He was a pillar of every civic, cultural, sports, and business group in St. James and the bordering parishes. His influence throughout Western Jamaica was colossal. It is in that part of Jamaica he was most able to translate effectively Norman Manley's vision that an independent Jamaica must rely on self-reliant communities populated by self-respecting, confident individuals whose collective efforts could lead to their empowerment through economic, social, and spiritual upliftment. Beyond the appreciation of his work among us and his exemplary service, we must treasure the life of Howard Cook for what it revealed about the importance of truth, fortitude, prudence, and faith. He was proud of who he was in the work he did as family man and patriarch, teacher, churchman, philanthropist, political representative, manager in the insurance industry, minister of government, and Governor General. His relationships in all of these roles, his speech, his action, reflected consistently a deeply held spiritual conviction that he was on earth for a purpose, one beyond personal gain and material advancement. His every exploit was to promote the greater good for all. He was never overwhelmed by the trappings of high office, nor ever displayed a sense of entitlement despite his historical role in shaping the political agenda. His disarming smile and his encouragement of younger persons to freely speak their minds helped to build confidence. He was urbane and humane, gracious, dignified, and of stately bearing. He was the quintessential mentor for life. To him, serving his island home with humble pride was a natural obligation. So his was a genuine 
and not affected humility. Political engagement for him was simply a means to the greater end of full national development. Narrow partisanship of any kind never colored his principles, nor even defined his positions or his utterances. He took his political reversals with equanimity and malice towards none. But do not be fooled, for in the rough and tumble of political contests, he was always able to hold his own. I must share this story with you. When I offered myself for the leadership of the party, the members of a group, renowned and legendary, formed in the time of Father Coombs and known as Red Square, came all the way to Kingston to pledge their support. And they said to me, we will have to do things from time to time in your name of which you may disapprove and we don't mind if you reprimand us but it is in your interest so i said what do you mean they said you remember a meeting in lucy when somebody challenged teacher cook for the chairmanship of the region i said yes he said remember when you all had to take flight i said yes he said, well, all we had from teacher was a nod. So with that story, when I met him next and told him, I thought he was going to reprobate. He said to me, PJ, the battle is the Lord's. You're lucky I didn't shake my head. He sought to serve his people in ways which developed the best in them by encouraging their creativity. Always conscious of the fact that as a people, there was more in our shared lives to unite us than those elements which divide us. He used every avenue to encourage us to draw strength from our achievements as a nation while exhorting every Jamaican to develop our full potential in the wonderfully creative dimensions of our being. Himself, an outstanding and early nationalist, he regarded the national anthem, the national pledge, and the national motto as the bedrock that should shape our destiny. As governor general, he was divided always driven always by the intention to unite. And he was guided by three broad views of the office. One, that it should be viewed as an instrument to develop a sense of unity by being accessible to all Jamaicans, irrespective of race, color, religion, or social status. Two, that the office should be kept abreast with the major changes occurring in the society and be exposed to the main currents of thinking within the country and the world. Three, that the office should be one of the main instruments of national unity and social inclusion. He was never content to be an honorary patron just to have another title. He took it only when he was able to become actively engaged as a standard bearer for the success of each organization and advance of the particular enterprise. The Jamaica Agricultural Society, the Boy Scout Movement, the International University of the Caribbean, the Jamaica Institute of Management, the Lay Preachers Initiative, the Jamaica Cricket Board were among the main beneficiaries of his steadfast support. He established the Governor General's Achievement Award to recognize people for the work they were doing in their communities. To avoid isolation, he initiated regular meetings with leaders from different sectors of the society. He was a revered leader in his own church, but he created an ecumenical council 
of all religious groups which met regularly at King's House. When the history of this period comes to be written, it will show that for 15 years, the most honorable Sir Howard Cook discharged the constitutional functions vested in him with such balance and distinction that divergent executive functions, one after another, were entrusted to that high office by bipartisan agreement and national consent. Today, the Governor General is no longer confined to purely ceremonial duties as Her Majesty's representative. Howard Cook belongs to a highly distinguished group of Jamaican leaders whose mission was to transform the social, cultural, political, and economic landscape of our country. His was a contribution marked by excellence, derived from a strong sense of purpose, and fueled by the firm conviction that our people should not be constrained to being hewers of wood and drawers of water in their own native land. It is incontrovertible. Howard Cook occupies a unique space in the annals of Jamaican history. He ranks among the finest of our pioneers. He is now the last of a special breed, the oldest surviving representative of the Jamaica Union of Teachers, the final survivor of that revolutionary body which became the architects of our modern political structure, the last member of the short-lived federal parliament of the West Indies, the acknowledged dean of Caribbean presidents and governors general. To his eternal credit, he lived his beliefs and in so doing set high standards of integrity, honesty, and Christian witness driven by the divine hand to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with his God. He has earned deservedly a unique place in the pantheon of Jamaican history. The marvelous journey from goodwill to the conferment of the scepter at King's House on Emancipation Day 1991 is the story on which fables are written. Howard Cook's relentless pursuit of an inspired lifelong mission ensured the outcome of its positive realization. This son of noble St. James has managed to fashion the template for our own indigenous nobility. As we honor his memory and write his epitaph, let us recognize the integrity of character and the unshakable sense of civic duty and dedicated responsibility which impacted on all aspects of his life and seminal work. Let us pledge anew to emulate his virtues and build on the values he maintained and to complete a work, admittedly one still in progress, the building of that new Jamaica, which relies on the resilience, tolerance, and strength of its people, which fulfills the promise of our native land to become triumphant, proud, and free. Dr. the Most Honorable Sir Howard Felix Hanlon Cook issues today his final proclamation, God is good. Loud let the trumpets sound in the glorious halls of Valhalla. His mighty work on earth has ended. And as he enters the celestial kingdom, and he often commanded us to say, Amen and amen. The most honorable P.J. Patterson bringing the remembrance at the Thanksgiving service for 
former Governor General Sir Howard Cook, some of the outstanding things said. This son of Noble St. James has managed to fashion the template for own indigenous for nobility. In aid of the Farm Heights United Church in Montego Bay, we'll sit together and stand at the last verse. And can it be?
and in the Heavenly offering Father, hymn, we the offering was you made as the, the owner of our United Church and managers of what you have entrusted to us. We dedicate these gifts, freely given and gratefully received, for the work of the Farm Heights United Church in Montego Bay, and for the building of honest, caring relationships across all lines of differences. In making these offerings to you, we give you thanks and pray for a spirit after the fashion of your servant, Sir Howard Felix Handlon Cook, with whom you gifted us, who spent his life and dedicated himself to us and to you in enduring service. Through his own example, he taught us to search for meaning in this life which we share, promoting religious freedom, practicing compassion, and working for justice together and apart. May these gifts and the work of our hands and hearts give power to all we stand for as a community of faith, as a nation of brotherly and sisterly love. Bless our offering, may be used to benefit your kingdom. We pray for your direction and guidance for its use. May these gifts, given with generosity and love, help our nation and our world become more peaceful, caring, fair, and free. As a nation, we offer respect and caring to all who seek hope and wholeness. We search for meaning with freedom and responsibility, and we live our faith through compassion and action. We dedicate these gifts, freely given and gratefully received, to our shared work, shaping a better world for all. Thank you for calling us to be good stewards over your gifts. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and risen Savior. Amen. The Most Reverend Charles Dufour offering the prayer of dedication. We now prepare for a musical item which will be delivered by the Hope United Church.
musical item by the Hope United Church. Now we prepare for the message which will be brought by the Reverend Dr. Maitland Evans. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the memorable moments spent at home with Sir Howard and Lady Cook has left a very special gift in my own mind and heart. In one of those times when Lady Cook brings humor to the table, she looked across at Sir Howard and she said to him, you're going to go before me. <laughs> Sir Howard, who never misses his opportunity to share in good humor, didn't venture a smile. And on reflection, I said to myself, it is his care and concern for Lady Cook being left behind. I believe today all of the voices are clear that he has left Lady Cook and the rest of the family in the care and love of a grateful nation. I wrestled with the message and I, as I wrestled with it, I said to myself, Sir Howard, will be listening. I say that against the background that those who die in the Lord, even though they are at rest, their eternal soul live on and their spirit mingle with us. Not only as spirit, but in terms of the footprints and signposts which they leave behind. As a young boy spending time in, with my maternal grandparents, I learned from them something which has remained with me. In the nights, when they go to sweep out the dust from the house or to throw water outside. And they always say, family, family, move there. Don't make me throw dirty water on you. It was a sense of the presence of the spirit of those whose souls are at peace in the Lord. So for teacher, it is not so much how we celebrate his life. It is much more about how his life teaches us how to discover and live that more excellent way. And so I drew some words from St. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19 says, Do not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
And this is the powerful summary verse. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. I learned to appreciate Sir Howard in what I believe is at his best and most potent stage of his wisdom. We shared in the formation, he as our founding chancellor of the International University of the Caribbean, we shared on behalf of the United Church in Jamaica and the Caribbean. And he said, as we struggled with a sense of direction, he says the greatest gift that any university or institution of education can give to a people is to know that people and to grow with that people. And out of the journey of knowing and growing, to bring to a grateful nation the quality leadership without which we make no progress. I believe that vision as one of his profound teaching moments. So when this great drama of life that he has lived has come to its close, it is out of the wisdom of his learning. It is out of how he distinguished himself as a bridge of life for so many who seek for greater fullness and inspiration that we ask, what is his source? And when we ask, what really was his source? It is a teaching, learning question. Because we are asking ourselves as we reflect in his spiritual presence, what is the source of our own legacy? Where is our treasure? What is it that is most essential to us? That without which we would be other than we would be intended to be. For the scripture is clear. Where your treasure is, at this uh, your heart there also. So I took from that that passage, a sense of Sir Howard as a man of heart and a man of eyes. Because we are clear indeed that when the heart stops beating, death has arrived. Oh, there are many galvanized corpses. There are many people who have died but are being held together in whatever ways and for whatever reasons. But it is the heart which is that traditional way of helping us to wrestle with the question of whether not whether we are standing up, not whether we are talking, not whether we are building legacies, 
but whether we are truly alive. Or is in this season, it is that essential understanding of the gift of life and the meaning and purpose of life. It is in these kinds of situations where that those questions become very special. And what about the eyes? Because in one sense, we have eyes, so many of us, we have eyes that we do not see. Because it is our eyes, not so much now as light that we will look at a little more, but eyes as that capacity to pierce the dark places of our own lives the capacity for inward vision that eye that looks inside is a powerful eye the person who has lost the skill of the eye that looks within is an unaware person who is a danger to self and to others the eye does not only look in, but I also gives us the capacity and competence to look out, to look beyond the known horizons, to see beyond the horizons, and to understand the nature of vision, vision that does not allow itself to be blocked by the trees or the walls or the obstacles of time we see beyond and that is vision I want us to contemplate the concern for the heart and the eye Sir Howard a man of heart and eye a man who is able to look within himself and look beyond himself and summons us to recognize that as a spiritual gifting which allows us to see through the spirit and hear through the spirit. Without eyes that are truly open without that lamp that illumines our inner self. We constitute a social liability to self and others. I want to suggest to us that self, Sir Howard epitomizes that self-aware conscious person who teaches us how to live with self-respect because he's a self-aware person and the law teaches us how to touch lives, how to help, how to heal, how to unite, and to bring people together from all walks of life. That is a skill that he has demonstrated time and time again. I see in this audience. life time and time again year after year sir howard facilitated the bringing together of people on neutral ground to be talking with each other and asking what are the ways forward in the naughty challenges that face you in your context but more importantly face us as a people and face us as a nation I say to us, those of us who take serious the business of that visionary seeing, take also seriously the business of our missional calling. Because 
our missional calling is not concerned about who is walking with us but is concerned about whether where and how we are walking is concerned about obedience rather than disobedience because many who do not who choose not to walk the trodden path are not people who find company very easily when the missional person makes a journey forward it is as with a sense of obedience to a higher calling the concept of mission says it is god who calls it is god who sends it is god who accompanies and god is already there at work in the context of mission to which he calls and to which he sends and sir howard by his life tells us it's missional time in Jamaica it is not important only to see but to live with the obedience of a call and ascending to make a difference in challenging and difficult times we should not assume that because there are eyes, those eyes possess that special light. So there is a vision of light which allows us to see forward. But there is another kind of light that is captured in the way Jesus himself sought to define his own direction and purpose. He said in seven glorious words, I am the light of the world. Darkness does not have the last word. Ignorance does not have the last word. And I mean ignorance in the two ways that we define it. Because we define it in terms of not knowing. But we also define ignorance in the sense of our loss of control of our emotions our loss of control and self-respect which is able to accord to the other person on the ground on which that person stands the sense of uncall to respect i learned every day that i shared sir howard's space that his sense of self-respect gave him the edge on taking that humility of spirit with him whether he was talking to the powerful men and women who visit king's house or he was talking with the ordinary everyday persons in the street or he was building bridges of understanding in his congregation as a lay pastor in Farm Heights. And inside of that congregation, I tell you, sisters and brothers, there were every political stripe and color and all other divisive accompaniments. Sir so Howard learned how to bend down and touch lives. And to say to those lies, I have met the Lord and he has sent me to set you free of the ignorance and the dog-heartedness that is going to tear us apart unless we learn through the light of Christ how to touch the lives of others and to make a difference in their lives because you learn to love them as you love yourself. So it is this light that has to be lit. Different versions of, of the Bible talk about light in terms of lantern or lamp or candle. And believe you me, we could have those candles and lanterns on our mantelpiece on our tables day in, day out, unless they are lit. And unless the light is not simply the matches, 
but the light of Christ that transcends human capacity and exposes us to a spirituality of power that does not only demand change but has the potency to produce change that's what we're talking about now so sister and the brother this light does not only cultivate readiness to see inside and outside of our own lives it brings to the forefront of our relationships the capacity of self-awareness and other awareness that was very true to whom and natural to whom so Howard was and there is no greater greater vision for the victory and greatness of a people than that which teach us that which teaches us how to truly seek out our neighbors and love them as we love ourselves the bottom line of this we are required to love ourselves because it is that which is the potent gift which allows us to recognize we cannot give what we do not have I say to us as churches brothers and sisters we are meeting there is no organization that is meeting more frequently day in day out and when our nation faces challenges and crisis it is an organization which talks about the need for healing and the righteous empowerment which transcend the kinds of boundaries that we set up to set one people one group against the other those bridges of love and understanding are never going to be built until and unless the gathered community of faith meeting week in week out on a Saturday understand that their healing calling is the centerpiece of a mission when there is so much pain and hurt and brokenness in our land so I call us to discover where our treasure really is and to discern where or whether our treasure is where it is meant to be it is all this that tells us about the confidence to which we are called it is all this that tells us that we have begun to demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that we have the capacity every day, every blessed day of our lives in so many areas of our lives to punch above our weight. It gives us confidence and capacity inside of the church, inside of the parliament, inside of our community. Capacity and confidence. Let us take that away so that we know how to take the lessons of a life well lived and to teach the nation God's way so Howard's legacy of bridge building of helping more and more must and will live on in the hearts and lives of those who come with eyes and hearts that have been so hardened that they cannot open there is a way to bring that openness because of the spiritual power and the gifting of God's Holy Spirit so we celebrate the fact that so Howard's legacy is not to be judged by the state of his bank account 
the bank account that he has left behind. But by the account of a well-lived life through which he continues to teach, to teach the nation. It is not so much the monuments of achievement that we see, but the solid teaching moments that beckon us to rise up and build together with passion and persistence. It is not so much the wealth of Jamaica's treasury, because that must have a heavenly portion in order for it to meet all that we need. It is not so much the wealth of Jamaica's treasury that will have the last word in Jamaica. Instead, it is the infectious triumph of the human spirit. It is that which was at the heart of the teacher. So we salute you, Sir Howard. You live on in all that is great and good and gracious about us as a people. May your soul indeed rest in the arms of the Maker and live forever in our own hearts and in our own lives. Amen. The message brought by Reverend Dr. Maitland Evans. And now we prepare for the final stage of the Thanksgiving service here at the Holy Trinity Cathedral. The hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
and now one of the soloists for this service will be singing the holy city that's miss gray smith Last night I lay asleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven and surround me thought the again the scene was changed new earth there seemed to be i saw the holy city beside the tideless sea the light of god was on its streets the gates were open wide and all who would might enter and know
the holy city delivered by Ms. Grace Would Smith. Would the family at this time please stand? Prayer for the family, Reverend Dr. Margaret Fowler. Eternal God, you hold all souls in life. We praise you for those who have shared this earthly life with us and have entered into eternal life with you. Especially we thank you for Howard, for all that made him special, all that you gave him and accomplished in him, all that he meant to those who knew and loved him. In the silence of our hearts, we remember with gratitude. And now we are thankful to you that for Howard Felix Hanlon Cook, all pain and suffering are ended and that death itself is conquered. Help us to release him into your care and keeping in the confidence that all life finds its fulfillment with you in the joy of your everlasting kingdom. And we commend to you those who will miss Howard the most in the days to come because they loved him best, especially Lady Ivy, Howard and Richard and Audrey, and all the members of his family, grandchildren, great-grand, grant that casting every care on you, they may know the consolation of your love. God of all comfort, in the midst of pain, heal us with your love. In the darkness of sorrow, shine upon us as the morning star. Awaken in us the spirit of mercy, that as we feel the pain of others, we may share with them the comfort we receive from you. And bring us at the last, with all your people, into the kingdom of your glory, where death itself is ended and every tear is wiped from every eye. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory both now and for all eternity. Amen. You may be seated. The prayer of thanksgiving will be done by the Right Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble We continue Noble in prayer. God of all grace, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to break the power of death and bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus shared our life and took upon himself our death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers Look not on us, but look on us as found in Jesus and bring us safely through the judgment to the joy and peace of your presence. Let us commend our brother Howard to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Gracious God, by your power, you gave us life. And in your love, you are giving us new life in Jesus Christ. We entrust Howard to your safe keeping in the faith of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who died and rose again to save us and to bring us all to a joyful resurrection and the glory of your eternal kingdom. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon your servant Howard. 
we pray in your name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses. Lead us not, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand and receive the benediction. And now to the one who can keep you from falling and set you in the presence of his glory, jubilant and above reproach, to the only God our Savior, be glory and majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord. The peace of God which is beyond all understanding Guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. And the blessing of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Please remain standing for the national anthem. remain standing and in your appropriate places as we have the recessional. And now we prepare for the recessional. While the clergy leaves the 
altar and the sanctuary at this time. Members of the Pera party are positioning themselves to take the coffin from the church. Bearer party in getting in position. Positioning themselves at the sanctuary where the coffin has been laying in state. They now lift the coffin from the Karakak. Momentarily, they will hoist that coffin onto their shoulders. The members of the Bearer Party with the coffin now aloft will make their way from the sanctuary onto the outside of the church. Warrant Officer 2 Easton Douglas is the warrant officer in charge of the Bearer Party. The officer in charge of the Bearer Party is Captain Finicky Rowe. And uh, Warrant Officer Class 1, Anthony Lyside, is the conducting officer. And so slowly, the Bearer Party makes that walk down the aisle onto the outside of the Holy Trinity Cathedral. Once on the outside of the Holy Trinity Cathedral, they will, in a measured manner, make their way along the walkway to the front gate and from there they will put the coffin on the gun carriage and that gun carriage will be drawn by a Toyota Land Cruiser and will be taken to National Heroes Park. May I remind you of the route once out on North Street the procession will travel west along North Street and then that procession will turn right, which is north onto East Street until the entrance of the National Heroes Circle. I'm warning and preparing residents and commuters in the general area that you will be hearing explosions and those will be coming from the 21 gun salute which will occur. The first one, the first round will occur the moment the procession marches off from the Holy Trinity Cathedral. The second battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, is forming the Guard of Honor. At this time you can hear some of the commands being given. The clergy are making their way out. It was a little warm in the church but it's extremely windy on the outside. And so here comes the coffin with the bearer party. making their way now onto, onto the flat area of the Holy Trinity Cathedral, just in front of the entrance to the church. So safely from the sanctuary, down the aisle, and now they are going to be moving to the left of the statue that is located at the, at the main entrance of the, to the Holy Trinity Cathedral. Immediately behind the bearer party are the insignia bearers, bearers and they are taking the insignias that were accorded to Sir Howard Cook. And we move now carefully 
to the gun carriage, which is located just on the entrance of uh, the church on the outside at North Street. Once there, the bearer party will position and place the coffin onto the gun carriage, which is really uh, used to be an old British artillery piece uh, that was used with the howitzer, used as supporting fire for the infantry during attacks. And it's also a wooden platform. So these uh, bearer party now, the bearer party are now making their way with the final remains of the third, the third uh, native governor general. The second battalion, the Jamaica regiment, forming the guard of honor with their newly consecrated colors. the men who formed the Guard of Honor here today. The Bear Party now just making their way onto North Street with a coffin. Brilliant sunshine, very windy on the outside. And now they do that ridiculous turn to line up with the gun carriage. Then, of course, they'll position it onto the wooden platform. The carriage will be driven by the 2012 Toyota Land Cruiser and the private Sergeant Philip So, the studio's position. The coffin is now taken. Slightly lowered, draped with the Jamaica, Jamaica flag. Which is the flag is now lifted. So we shift it incrementally onto the wooden platform, taking the instructions. And of course, conducting officer, more officer class Nice. Ensuring that everything is precisely where it ought to be at this time. This a little bit of trouble with the wind. That's a little better for you, so do not. Trinity Cathedral. The bearer party now ensuring that that flag is uh, properly anchored as they prepare to release the now down. As they will prepare to be part of this procession. The, it'll be strapped on, the flag is going to be strapped on. You'll notice at this time that the, the, the members of the Bear Party you notice they have their hands positioned to their right shoulder. And this is an anticipation of the hat orderlies, uh, both on both sides of the gun carriage, the members of the Bear Party are located and they are now receiving their hats from the hats, hat orders. And uh, at a particular time, with a particular direction, they will move their hats to their heads. The hat orderlies are Private e. Hemmings and Private J. Edwards for the insignia the Harrison. Properly donned, you now the men are outfitted to begin that march. The Guard of Honor, crisp on this wonderful afternoon when we think of a man who was teacher, mentor, who was someone that we can all be proud from 
Two ranks, they have now formed three. They will now unfix their bayonets, which is they will take the bayonet from the SLRs, put them in their holsters, which they are doing. The bayonet is a very sharp instrument that is attached to the SLR. Done so with precision. You can hear the guard commander, Belgian Mouse with commands. So they are prepared now for the journey to begin, the procession with the clergy just ahead of the land cruiser. And ahead of that, which is, uh, if you know the area well, nearer to the, or nearer to St. George's College, we have the mass bands and uh, corps of drums led by Warrant Officer Clark 1, Albert Sean Heard. And so, quick march, just a bit of information. In quick march, the steps are 116 to the minute which is quite different from their slow march, which is 65 paces to the minute. Regimental Sergeant Major Clinton is ensuring, Brown, ensuring that his Clinton Brown, that his warrant officer one, Clinton Brown, giving those sharp instructions to the guard. Now, walking along in this procession, the Chief of Defense Staff, along with Acting for the Acting Commissioner of Police, Deputy Commissioner of Police Blake, other members of the uh, senior ranks of the uniform groups, and then momentarily you will be hearing the sounds of the mass bands and core of drums. The cars, the family cars, are immediately behind the gun carriage and the bearer party and the insignia bearers, the family cars are immediately behind it. They are now being lined in position. And then all other uniform groups, including the Jamaican Constabulary, will be coming along from the eastern end of North Street, moving west. And that is what is happening now. Uh, those family members who are able to will in fact be marching and members of the political parties the Prime Minister, I'm not certain if she will be taking the trek, but uh, you'll see them now lining up behind the family cars provided. There's also a hearse that is provided in this lineup in the case of eventuality. There's an ambulance as well, and uh, so everything is in place as we normally prepare for uh, a funeral of this nature. And. Uh, Several persons have turned out here today to say their farewell to our third native Governor General, Sir Hal Cook. Now they have reversed arms, uh, and you can hear now the preparation for the master bands and core of drums. The music will start momentarily. They will begin with uh, the Dead March for Saul, and that was composed by Handel. There are going to be three pieces of music along the route. The first one, the Dead March for Saul. And then the second one, change. The second one will be the Funeral March, composed by Chopin. And the third march, which will take them inside the National Heroes Circle, into the National Heroes Park, and next to uh, the section, the grave site, is Beethoven Funeral March, entering into National Heroes Park. That's a funeral march composed by Beethoven. <laughs> Family members are all getting prepared to move along and members of the cabinet, members of the political parties, and other persons joining that group who will be part of the procession from the Holy Trinity Cathedral. And now, Conductor of the Mass Bands and Court Proms, Warrant Officer Class 1, Albert Shaw Heard, begins the Dead March for Saul, composed by Handel. <laughs> Notice 
we are now looking at the flag being flown at half mast here at the front of the Holy Trinity Cathedral. And you can hear the strains of the Dead Man Saul as the first piece of music to be played in this procession, which will take about 35 to 40 minutes. Immediately after that, we hear the funeral march composed by Chopin, and then after that, the funeral march by Beethoven, which will be the march that will take the procession into the National Heroes Park. We'll be carrying live from the National Heroes Park, but we'll also continue with commentary from this section of the procession. There are street liners along the entire route, and there are members of the Jamaica Defense Force who are also So here we are, members of the uniform groups uh, coming along the, the procession, just about uh, at this point, still members of the Jamaica Defense Force uh, moving through the, past the front gate of the Holy Trinity Cathedral. Really still bright and sunny, a little bit of haze and windy at points. The Jamaican Constabulary Force Band will be playing the music near the rear of the procession so that those persons who are halfway along the procession will be able to hear the music and keep the atmosphere and of course the slow march 65 paces to a minute, which will take them about 35 minutes to the National Heroes Circuit. So here's a man being bid on farewell, a gentleman who once in St. James in a political uh, election, which was highly competitive, made one of his vehicles available to his opponent. That's a measure of the man. The ambulance is always a part of functions of this nature. Now you see the men in green and black. This is the men of the 3rd Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, otherwise called the National Reserve. And the members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, you can get going to be handing over to Stacey Ann Smith at this time. So she will take on the coverage, continue the coverage here at North Street. And when next you hear from me, I'll be coming to you from the burial site of National Park. Thank you so much, Faye. And thank you for staying with us at home in the diaspora. DJIS is also streaming the ceremony on our website. So thank you to all Jamaicans who have tuned in to witness this final and fitting farewell to our former Governor General, Sir Howard Felix Hanlon Cook. The procession continues to move westward on North Street. And as Faye mentioned earlier, when it reaches the intersection of East Street, it will turn right onto East Street and make its way down to the National Heroes Park. And what you're hearing there is the Dead March for Saul by Handel. by the bearer of the party. And those are the men and women of the Jamaica Constabulary Force who are part of the procession today. There are more than 120 members of the JCF who are participating in the march today. And 
approximately 500 members of the Jamaica, Jamaica Defense Force from the 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, and 3rd Battalions. Today's procession is led by the 2nd Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, which recently commissioned new colors. And the parade commander is the head of the 2nd Battalion Jamaica Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel D.C. Laban. Now all along the route, you will see liners, street liners, and the number one escort furnished by 1JR and 2JR. You're watching now uniformed groups, the Jamaica Cadet Force. There are girls' guides. Boy Scouts. There you're watching the 3rd Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, also known as the Reserves, making their way westward on North Street, right by the St. George's College. This is indeed a fitting send-off for a man who considered himself a humble servant of the Jamaican people. From small beginnings right to the top, Sir Howard Cook always remained humble. In an interview with the Jamaica Information Service, about six years ago or so, he said, my childhood was a very happy one. I was a village boy and ran around the village barefooted like the rest of the little boys, climbing trees, setting traps for birds. And he said his life was happy. And indeed, that sense of happiness and wholesomeness became a hallmark of his life as an adult, as a politician, as a teacher, as a lay pastor, and as a servant of the people. you will see there to the bottom right side of your screen an ambulance as with events of this nature a provision is always made for any eventualities and the ambulance is there to ensure that should the need arise there is assistance persons it is a hot day there is a lot of wind outside and the sun is beating down on the procession, but they march on in honor of Sir Howard. For persons living in and around the National Heroes Park, you by now would have heard explosions Fear not, they are part of the 21 gun salute for Sir Howard. The first one having been made as the procession left the Holy Trinity. 
and the last one will be sounded as the procession enters the National Heroes Park. And we're watching the rear of the procession passing St. George's College at this time. Uniformed youngsters looking very smart in their uniforms. Boy Scouts bringing up the rear of the procession. And as we head to the National Heroes Park to lay to rest the body of the late Governor General, I'll remind you of some of the remembrances. The former Prime Minister, the most honorable PJ Patterson, declared that Sir Howard was indeed no ordinary man. He talked about Sir Howard's formative years and the important role he played as a nation builder and gave us some interesting stories about Sir Howard uh, as a youngster and, and as a pugilist, which many people may not have known. And it gave us an insight into the man who became our beloved Governor General. Indeed, Sir Howard was a disciplinarian. And as a teacher, he commanded the respect of not only his peers, but of the community in general. A longtime colleague and friend told us in an interview, told the JIS in an interview, that he had never seen Sir Howard get into a temper. You know, even when they were, you know, walking together and he was needling him. He was very cautious and, and, and would laugh and, you know, be good-natured. But he would never lose his cool.
members from the second battalion, the Jamaica Regiment. And following that, we will see members of the mast bands and corps of drums of the JDF, led by bandmaster Albert Sean Hearn. Procession is going at a slow march, 65 paces to the minute, and they should be a little more than halfway on that journey to Heroes Park by now. Mounted riders from the JCF. All along this route, there are liners, street liners, a little more than 100 street liners to be exact. And they will ensure that the procession maintains its form and order as the men and women make their way to the park. You will also notice that their rifles are reverse butts out. by the 2nd Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment. And of course, that battalion commanding office, Lieutenant Colonel D.C. Laban, the Guard Commander today, Major Louis Cheveria, Cheveria, and Warrant Officer Class 1, Clinton Brown, the Powerade Regimental Sergeant Major. We're really having a challenging time with the wind here. When I listen to the remembrance given by former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson about, uh, I would say, late uh, Governor General Sir Howard Cook being a little rebellious and mischievous. I'm not surprised that we're having a little challenge with the wind. And um, it was also interesting to note that the Governor General as a boy not only played marbles and enjoyed horseback riding, but he was also a fine pugilist. And so <laughs> he uh, didn't pretend at any time when he needed to defend himself to use his boxing skills. So you can see to the left of your screen, members of the mounted troops provided by the Jamaica Constabulary Force. You can hear also the rounds of that 21-gun salute going off. The final one really will go off once the procession gets through that gate. There is Lieutenant Colonel D.C. Laban the commanding officer, that's a gentleman just immediately behind the mounted troops, leading the 2nd Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, into National Heroes Park for the final portion of this service, which is the interment of the body of Sir, the most honorable Sir Howard Cook. All right, and we are now um, seeing the mounted troops coming on you. When we get a chance, we will show you the members of the Coast Guard who are here. They have the wreaths that will be laid and they're decked out in their usual Coast Guard, which is colors, white and blue. And you'll get a chance to see them in just a while. That sounds like the final round, the final round for the 21-gun salute accorded our 
former Governor General or third native Governor General, Sir, the most honorable Sir Howard Cook. So you can see now and hear, you can see the men of the 2nd Battalion, the Jamaica Regiment, with the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Laban, making their way just in front of the cenotaph here at Hebrew Circle. Very windy day. But we are, in fact, pressing along like good soldiers do. Everything. Then we form the guard of honor. You can see to the right of your screen just now, the conductor of the mass band and core of drums, Al Sean Heard. So they're coming now around, making their way around the cenotaph at the National Heroes Park, making their way up that very narrow pathway that has been, this, the entire grounds have been uh, refurbished, if you would like, by the engineering department of the Jamaica Defense Force, led by Colonel Martin Rickman. And so we have now, immediately behind the mounted troops, in the center. Native Governor General, Sir Howard Cook. Just want to remind us of some of the points raised by former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson in his remembrance. He said, Howard Felix Hamlin Cook was indeed no ordinary man. He was a fine human being. He displayed a tendency to rebelliousness as a child, which led him to do everything else except attend school regularly. And that's the man who became known as teacher. Another quotation from Mr. Patterson's remembrance. It was the quality of his performance at the Michael Training College and his willingness to challenge traditional approaches, which branded him early as a leader, a progressive thinker, and an activist prepared to give unstinting service in any endeavor to which he was committed. And now we see the gun carriage draped with the Jamaican flag carried by the bearer party from into the church and from the church and again they will lift that coffin from the gun carriage and bring it to the burial site. The burial site as you will see in a moment when we are able to give you that kind of shot is right across from the monument of Michael Manley. Members of the clergy are now making their way in. There is the Sangster monument across the road. Literally, there's a pathway, and Michael Manley's is in a shop that you are not able to see just yet, but we will, in fact, show you in a while. And then, interestingly enough, it is not usual, not to my mind and experience, to have poi trees blooming at this time of year. And so, Howard, here we have Mr. Manley's monument, Michael Manley, and uh, the burial site is located across westerly from Mr. Manley's monument. And we have members now of the family and other dignitaries making their way in. And the point I was making is that Sir Howard will be laid to rest beneath a pink poi tree carrying just a few blooms left. A man with a sunny disposition, but not outrageous, contained, rebellious as a child, and somebody we've known as a great patriarch on carriage, still moving along, coming in line now with the section 
from which it was just passing by the Donald Sandster Monument on the right and on the left the Michael Manley Monument. And now coming to the path that was recently erected by the Engineering Department Regiment of the Jamaica Defense Force from which at which the coffin will be taken off that gun carriage and brought across to the grave site. And now it has halted almost. Yes, drawn by the land cruiser. So we see the scores of people who've gathered here to say farewell. And now, having been strapped onto the gun carriage, coffin will be unstrapped and the members of the bearer party will lift it and take it to the gravesite. I think this gravesite here we have the members of the bearer party preparing for that lift. They have removed their hats and the hat orderlies will take them from the members of the bearer party. so that they can lift onto their shoulders the coffin. Just to remind you, it's uh, so windy here. Just reminding you, you may hear some interference from time to time. Forgive us, but it's way beyond our control. It's a really windy day. coffin, which you will not be able to see until the Jamaican flag is removed, which it will be, is dark stained polished hardwood with a cedar finish. The lining is off-white and the coffin is designed with swing bars and not handles, which is a more modern design. So you're looking now at the members of the bearer party as they prepare to meticulously remove the coffin from the wooden platform of that gun carriage. With precision, focus, and discipline, it's now lifted. And hoisted onto their shoulders. Eight members of the Bear Party carrying out this procedure. The flag being properly fixed. It's a challenge today because it is indeed windy. We can hear now the members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force Band bringing up the rear of this procession coming to the National Heroes Circle. These dirges always bring the somber moment really in focus. And listening to the members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force Band, you can see the members of the Bera Party moving along the recently paved walkway. There has to be and have been designated here, has been designated here a section for Governors General because not before now have we had one laid to rest at National Heroes Park. Sir Florizel Glasspool was laid to rest at the Providence Methodist Church in Ligony. And um, so today is the start of new beginnings. We have the officials who are on the side of the grave uh, looking southwards towards the sea. I can see the Governor General and the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition and others there, the President of the Senate, the Chief of Defense Staff. I can see Mr. Blake who is representing the Acting Commissioner of Police. The Mayor of Kingston is there as well and the family when they come in will be faced north, looking north with their back towards the sea. The members of the clergy will be faced to the, will be positioned to the west of the graveside. So the men and women, the men of the Jamaica Defense Force, the Bearer Party, now about to make a turn to bring that coffin in.
It is a funeral, and uh, it's not though a very sad occasion because a man had lived a life that made you recognize that you live well while you're alive, and those memories will be carried on not only by your family but by members of the wider Jamaican society. Lady Cook has been brought here too, and she's now the matriarch of the family, and she's being positioned on the family side of the grave. And we are looking very sharply, keeping a keen eye on the bearer party as it, at this time, as they position to lay this coffin onto the lowering device, which is situated at the gravesite. Of course, we will have certain rites that will be carried out before that coffin is laid, is laid to rest and lowered. Down slowly, the bearer party. They would have practiced this and worked on their position. This is indeed their final tribute to our former Governor General, to this patriot, to this mentor, to this father, to so many. So they shift into position over the lowering device. And this is a gravesite that has been prepared for two. So when Lady Cook passes on, she'll be interred here. So down onto that lowering device, assisted the members of the burial party bring that coffin to rest. Having completed their task, they take their commands, which will get them standing momentarily. The flag will go through the routine of what is known as the fold. And when we get to that point, you will notice that each fold is a consistent triangle. This outside broadcast is being brought to you by the collaborative effort of the main media enterprises in Jamaica, the Jamaica Information Service, CPTC, Television Jamaica, CVM, and the PBCJ. Members of the Jamaican Folk Sings leading the singing of that well-known chorus, He Lives. Different, a very difficult thing to hear them sing because it is windy and it's blowing away the sound coming from the folk song. But there they are, dressed in nice bright summer colors. Better sound coming from the Jamaican folk songs.
Shepherd, performed by the Jamaican folk singers. We brought right. nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all will be brought to life. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, says the Lord. I am the living one. I was dead, and now I live forevermore. The Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble Bloomfield, the Right Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble Bloomfield, moderator United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. If you keep your eyes on Howard, that flag. You were buried with Christ in baptism. And in that baptism, you were raised with him. And although you were dead because of your sins, God has brought you to life in Christ. If we died with Christ, we shall live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. There is nothing in death or life, in the world as it is, or the world as it shall be. Nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus said, for the moment you are sad, but I shall see you again, and then you will be joyful, and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. Then in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever has faith in me shall live, even though he dies. And no one who lives and has faith in me shall ever die. Notice the flag being fold, folded diagonally once. This is referred to as the fold, then folded diagonally twice. Then it will be folded in triangles, consistent triangles. You are getting a very lovely shot of this. First triangle, smooth. Second triangle. Triangle number three. Notice the hands of the members of the Bearer Party at the other end, holding taut and keeping smooth. Notice also that it is moving down towards the person who is doing the folding. I'm certain the family at this time are having that moment of mixed feelings. They feel pr proud that their husband, father, granddad, uncle, cousin is being honored in this fashion, but they would be very, very sorry and sad to see such a patriarch go. Ninety-eight years. Had he remained alive until July 22, he would have been married to his dear wife, Lady Cook, for 75 years. They got married in 1939, and they were the first couple to be married at the chapel at the Michael. Look at those consistent triangles in the fold.
you would have noticed too that the lowering device had in fact been mechanized and so once the fold started you'd have noticed that the coffin is now down. members of the bearer party almost having completed their duties. The folded flag is handed to the Bearer Party Warrant Officer. We have entrusted our brother Howard to God's merciful keeping. We now commit his body to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died, was buried, and rose again for us, and is alive and reigns forevermore. Lord, let now your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. There are six buglers that they're getting ready now with the last post and Ravelli. Played by the six buglers, conducted by Senior Drum Major Staff Sergeant Dunkley. We now invite those who are to lay a wreath.
the pair of gloves with the last post and uh, Ravelli. Now we have the laying of the wreaths. They are a member of them. A member of the family will be the first to lay a wreath. The members of the Coast Guard are in position with all wreaths and they will in fact individually move to the grave site and hand the wreath to the person who will be laying. You can see Warrant Officer Class 1 and to the nice side, ensuring that everything is in position there for the next event of the celebration. If you're just joining, we're at the grave site of our third Native Governor General at National Heroes Park. And now we have the first member of the Coast Guard moving in position. And uh, he's taking this wreath to a member of the family for it to be. And that member, of course, is uh, Sir Howard's eldest child, Justice Howard Cook. He's being assisted by a member of the Jamaica Defense Force. It is indeed a difficult time to have had a dad who was such a man, such a father, such a public figure, some, such a community person, to lose that person after 98 years. The void is great. Justice Howard Cook, the first to lay a wreath here this afternoon. And now, the Coast Guard, another member of the Coast Guard will move forward and this wreath will be laid by our Governor General, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, who positions himself. Handed over to his ADC. He's accompanied to the gravesite for the laying of his wreath. Lots of yellow in the wreaths, beautiful. Pink, fuchsia, some white. And so Sir Patrick lays his wreath. He's accompanied by his ADC back to his position on the opposite side of the grave. He not before bowing and showing respect, respect on the ADC saluting. Third member of the Coast Guard now makes his way across to the Prime Minister. She's also attended today by a member of the JDF. And so she's accompanied a member of the Coast Guard. She's being, she's being guided with the way that wreaths will be placed. Having done so, she returns to the easterly end of the grave to pay respects. The fourth member of the Coast Guard will take his wreath to the leader of the opposition. Andrew Holness now goes to the easterly end of the grave, pays respect, and then places his wreath.
the Coast Guard now takes the wreath to the President. Okay, I think we're having here the visiting uh, from King Man, McKeever Bush. the leader of the opposition, who has come for this funeral and to pay his last respects. Which he has. Moving now across to the President of the Senate, Senator Floyd Morris. He's being accompanied by his wife, Mrs. Morris. He pays respect and then returns to the northern side of the grave where he will lay his wreath. Being assisted, but pretty much on target. If you are just joining us, we're in the final stages of our farewell to our governor, former Governor General Sir Howard Cook. They pay their respect and will return to their positions. And now for the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Peart. Buttercup yellow. Happy wreaths, not dreary at all. He lays his wreath. Pays respect. And many of these people must be thinking of the many ways in which Sir Howard touched their lives. The next person to lay a wreath is the Chief Justice of Jamaica. Justice Zayla Makala. She pays respect. will be handed over to the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Anthony Anderson. Salute. This next wreath will be laid by the gentleman who is deputizing for the Acting Commissioner of Police, Mr. Blank. two wreaths left. The penultimate one will be laid by 
Mayor Angela Brown Burke. She returns to her position. And the final wreath will be laid by the representative of the People's National Party. And the task is being given to Minister Anthony Hilton. If you're watching at Farm Heights in St. James, I know you must be missing your teacher. If you're watching at Goodwill in St. James, you must be feeling very proud.
combined choir of the Jamaican folk singers and the National Youth Choral. Now we'll be treated to choruses, and I suspect that many of us will sing very soon and very soon as a first year. can keep my body down.
sing again, mine eyes have seen the glory. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the glory of the Lord. He is trampling of the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the painful lightning of his You to receive the final benediction. The remembrance that Go was given forth by in the peace of God in and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. The marvelous journey from goodwill to the conferment of the scepter of King's House on Emancipation Day 1991 is a story on which fables are written. Howard Cook's relentless pursuit of an inspired lifelong mission ensured the outcome of its positive realization. This son of noble St. James has managed to fashion the template for our own indigenous nobility an excerpt from the remembrance that was delivered by former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson. And as you can see, the members, the grave attendants, are completing their task here. The grave is built for two, and uh, we are just about uh, concluding our outside broadcast uh, of this Thanksgiving service and interment for our third Native Governor General. And uh, we'd just like to remind you that this gentleman, born November 13, 1915, died July 11, 2014, accomplished so much before he was 24. As was said in the remembrance by former Prime Minister Patterson, he accomplished so much at the age of 24, more than some people accomplish in their entire lifetime. Here's another excerpt. 
uh, he displayed a tendency to rebelliousness, which led him to do everything except uh, attend school regularly. In desperation, his mother packed him off to Grange Hill Elementary School, where he became one of 12 boys boarding with the headmaster, Frank Theophilus Sinclair. With teacher Sinclair as mentor and father figure, young Howard began devoting his intellect and energy to a mastery of academics, agriculture, and the performing arts. I leave you with the final excerpt from the remembrance that was given by former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson. Howard Cook belongs to a highly distinguished group of Jamaican leaders whose mission was to transform the social, cultural, political, and economic landscape of our country. His was a contribution marked by excellence, derived from a strong sense of purpose, and fueled by the firm conviction that our people should not be constrained to being hewers of wood and drawers of water in their own land. And so on behalf of all the members of the various teams in media who made this possible to, for you to share on television, I close off with a quote from his biography. They call me teacher. And here we go. Each and every one of us is a prerequisite, a determining factor of peace. Many of us believe that someone, somewhere, is the stumbling block. Have you ever asked if that someone could be yourself? That's my one wish for Jamaica now, peace. That we can find within ourselves the means of becoming like my little community of goodwill, where all of us were one. As for myself, when I leave King's House, I'll be heading home for St. James, where the people don't call me Governor General or Sir. They still call me Teacher. That's me. And I like it. And with that, we say our fond final farewell. What good? Teacher. The most honorable Sir Howard Cook was given the ultimate accolade of a state funeral. Sir Howard played an integral part in the foundation of a modern trade union movement, the transition through internal self-government to independence, and improving the social conditions of Jamaicans. His life was a symbol of the highest integrity in the public service.